welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us for another hour of great gardening. We had a really good time out on the road last week at the Legacy of the Plains Museum in Gehring. It's awfully nice to be back in the studio. No wind, no dirt, no sun in our faces, but that was a great, great trip. I'm joined tonight by our experts from Nebraska Extension. We have Wayne Onasor, who's going to be the bug guy. Good evening, Kim. Very first appearance in the chair, trying to answer turf questions, Dr. Rock Gaswa. I forgot where the studio was. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Timmerman is going to answer Rots and Spots questions. Hi, Kim. And Elizabeth Killinger, all of those landscape questions. Hi, Kim. You know, we need to hear from you as well. You just dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Emails and pictures for future shows get sent to byf at unl.edu. When you send us those questions, please give us as much information as you can, including where you live in the state. You can also follow Backyard Farmer during the week, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Pinterest, all those sorts of things. Okay, Wayne, we have not had an entomologist on the air since the dreaded green monster attacked Omaha. Yes. So that is appropriately your sample. Well, unfortunately, I also found it in Greenwood. Yes, they did. So I brought emerald ash borer detection kits. The box behind there, this is an emerald ash borer detection kit. Every extension office in the state is supposed to have one of these. Hopefully it's not buried and lost because they were sent a number of years ago. But we have them out there. They're prepped and ready. Inside of it, there is a detection envelope shown here. And inside of there is this little submission vial. And that's key. Everything should fit inside of this vial that fit, you think it might be emerald ash borer. If you have to squish it in, don't send it. <laughs> it's not emerald ash borer. We also have a lookalikes uh, sheet out there. So if you're wondering, uh, that's one thing you can look at. Also included in the box, are samples of ash from Michigan uh, and showing the serpentine galleries from the larval boring in, in the, to the tree as well as the exit holes that are D-shaped and they are about an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. So that's something you need to watch for. We do have some native borers that create sometimes at an angle they'll come out and they'll make a hole that looks a little bit D-shaped but you're definitely going to be much bigger. So when you're going to be submitting these samples, work with your local folks first to make sure that, uh, I've already had people turn in elm trees that have had some of the symptoms of emerald ash borer, what you might expect to see, but it, it just doesn't quite match because it's the wrong type of tree. Uh, go through your extension office. Uh, if your local NRD has a forester, you can use them. Uh, one of the Nebraska Forest Service uh, district folks that are out in the state, those are all good places to start. Uh, if we do decide that we need to send something in, it is expected that those individuals that have that sample where it's coming from be discreet. Don't be putting it out on social media or telling everybody. Uh, we need to make sure we do this properly and it goes through the proper ID chain. It'll come down to Lincoln and then it'll move up through the diagnostic lab and then through USDA where it will get confirmed with APHIS. Excellent, thanks Wayne. So those of you who send us pictures, we love pictures, but we cannot identify emerald ash borer from, from a picture. We're, we're just not going to do it for you. We're not allowed, and yeah. it has to be a physical sample sent through the proper ID chain. All right, thank you, Wayne. Okay, Rock, you brought salad. Yes, I did this uh, plethora of petals in front of me. Um, <laughs> it's all from the same plant, which is kind of intriguing, and I'm holding up one of the end pieces. This is uh, purslane, common purslane, not to be confused with the ornamental purslane you can buy in the garden stores. They have a much larger leaf and a much showier flowers. And when this one does flower, it's going to be a little short, stubby, sort of nondescript kind of flowery looking thing. Uh, red, fleshy stems, succulent leaves. The reason we bring this up is that, you know, when it gets to this size, where you've got, you know, stems the size of a pencil on them, or even before that, when you get ready to pull it, or hoe it, we're not gonna suggest that that's not a really good idea. Because if you have a piece of leaf or a piece of node and it falls back to the ground, chances are, especially if you have a leaf and a node connected, some work that one of our graduate students did, Chris Proctor, um, showed that you'll get 90% take. That's better than some seed, right? So mm -hmm. that's something you wanna be very, very careful of. So generally we're gonna recommend um, hand pulling when it's very young and you know you can get the entire plant. And when it gets to this size, um, you can try to pull it, but try to get up every fragment that you can. At this point in time, with this large plant, um, 
You can spray all day and all you're doing is wasting your time as well as introducing excessive amount of uh, pesticide into the environment. When it's smaller, you might be able to control it, but really the best approach is pre-emergent herbicides. Um, Daxol, or excuse me, um, Prodiamine, most of the ones that are used for the home lawn work well even in the garden. Um, Treflan or um, um, preen type products work really, really well. Um, you want to get it on relatively early, make sure it gets watered in, and you should get upwards of 95% control. The rest you should be able to remove by uh, with your hands. But and the last thing is, is this, this is extremely edible. It makes a really good salad. Um, be careful that if you're going to harvest it for that, that there hasn't been any spraying done. Don't go out into a park and p pick it up. But if you've got some in your yard and you want to grow it up, um, but you want to catch it when it's at this stage, in that smaller leaf stage, not when it gets as big as a pencil, because it tends to get bitter as it progresses. But it's an extremely edible, versatile weed. It's an ornamental with the same species, but uh, selection and Controlling it now is just pretty much a waste of time. If you're going to hoe it, make sure you pick, get, pick, pick up every fragment because if you don't, chances are it could repropagate. Excellent. Thanks, Rock. All right, Amy. Lovely rot. Great spot. That it is. <laughs> Today I brought in Pestman. Thank you for Terry James for pointing it out to me in the backyard farmer garden. Um, but this is rust on Pestman. It starts on the lower leaves, as you can see here. The, lower, the bottom leaves here are pretty much brown and it's progressing its way up. So as with any typical rust, cedar apple rust, pear rust, all these rust species kind of give us these nice little orangish colored lesions on the, up on the upper leaf surface, um, that orange halo brown spot. And then when you flip it over is when we actually see the sporulation that is occurring. So you're gonna see these little tendrils little hairs coming out of the bottom and that's the spores coming out. Typically we don't need a treat for pestamine rust, um, but this year we saw, we're seeing it because of the wet conditions, wet cool conditions that we've continued to have up until about two, three weeks ago. Um, if this is a persistent problem, early season fungicide applications is when you're gonna do it. This isn't the time of year to be treating it. We're gonna be treating it as that pestamine is really coming up and right before it starts blooming um, to provide some protection. If you have some really severe plants, removing those plants and composting them correctly is the best way to remove that inoculum source out of your landscape and garden beds um, to prevent it from coming back the next year. All right, thanks Amy. All right, Elizabeth, something from the backyard farmer garden. Another something from the backyard <laughs> farmer garden, but this one is edible. Um, what it is, is it's a nectar plum. And from the name, it's a nectarine crossed with a plum. Um, and so it's really kind of fun, unusual, interesting. Um, it's a really, really pretty tree, um, kind of a little bit darker red foliage on it. It grows very well, but just like some of the other fruits that are out there, you need to make sure that you protect them from the squirrels. Because when I went underneath this tree, there was a lot of uh, fruit bodies underneath there where the squirrels had eaten the outsides off but left the inside in there. And so you need to, if you're going to protect them, protect them from not only the squirrels, but they also had a little bit of insect damage on there too. And I know we've talked about fruit tree sprays before. If you're going to spray, spray religiously. If not, um, then don't. And so um, I picked a couple good ones that had a little insect damage, but no squirrel damage. So that's the good news there. And also not ready for humans to eat yet because they're hard enough to break a window. Yep, they're still hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Wayne, you get the first pictures, and there are a couple of them, uh, of interesting creatures. We don't know where this one is from, but I do know that there are people out in the Lexington area that are seeing this guy. And he uh, describes it as simulated eyes and an attack posture that is alarming. What is that one? It's an eastern-eyed click beetle. We have these in all of the historically wooded areas of the state and those that have become wooded. Uh, the larvae are actually predaceous on other insects that feed in rotting wood. Excellent. So uh, very beneficial and fun insect to play with. Turn them on their back and watch them click over, <laughs> like flipping a coin. Perfect. And how about that guy? I see this one a lot. It's our western conifer seed bug. It likes to eat seeds of pines and spruce trees. Hmm. So we typically see, I get these from people that have those either in their yard or in their windbreaks close to where they found them. All right, so it's kind of cool bug time of year, I think, because we're getting a lot of insect. Well, the list. heat helps with that. We had some moisture, so we've got the humidity and the heat, and, and things will start to go. Excellent. All right, and things will start to go because your picture, Rock, is a brown spot <laughs> in the yard 
uh, clay soil in Saunders County, browns at any sign of hot and dry weather. He thinks it's the soil. What do you think? It's very possible it could be the soil. Let's start by doing some little quick diagnostics. If they have an irrigation system, although I kind of zoomed in on this picture and I didn't see any heads, so I'm going to say it's not irrigated. If it was irrigated, I'd look for a broken head right out of the gates or maybe incorrect overlap. Maybe you got a broken main somewhere or something. So that's the first thing you might want to think about. But that said, you know, they said heavy clay, and you know when we build a house, we move soil around, and you can get hot spots. It happens quite frequently. So the question is, is what do you do about it? Uh, run an airify over it, not now, that's too hot, but come into this fall, run an air fire over it. Consider incorporating some organic matter or compost material or something like that. Let's get the organic matter out. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be the immediate cure and it's going to help for next year. It may take multiple times. And if you're picking your clippings up, quit doing that because addition of gourmet organic matter really improves these clay soils. So I'm gonna think that it's soil improvement is probably gonna go the best way. Do not incorporate sand into clay, thinking that's going to make it lighter and drain better. What you get is what we make our sidewalks out of, concrete, so let's not do that. All right, thanks, Rock. Amy, mm -hmm. uh, we're not sure where this viewer is from, but have sent a picture of something that he says is growing on the underside of the soffit, about eight feet above the ground. It was here last year in the exact same spot. He wonders, is this a plant piece or is this mold? What do we decide this is? Oh, when we start looking at it, it looks like it's remnants of Boston ivy that was growing up. And this is mold um, breaking down the Boston ivy on that soffit. So nothing of major concern um, going on there. If you are really concerned, you don't like the mold, you know, a 10% solution of bleach um, would solve the problem really fast, put it in a bucket and wipe off that area with that bleach. It would prevent the mold from growing. But that mold's going to go away once all that organic matter is decomposed of that remnant of that Boston Ivy. So nothing of major concern. And, and for those of you who wish to paint over those little frog feet stickers, mm -mm. <laughs> they're there forever. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Elizabeth, we have a, an unfortunate linden. This is one that a uh, 20-year-old, 40-foot-tall, split in the trunk. Uh, she thinks that happened just recently, doesn't seem to have affected the health of the tree, but there was a split on the other side of the tree. She had an ash removed and wondered if the open space caused that tree to crack. She wonders about cabling uh, or taking it out. And this is a Portsmouth, Iowa viewer. Sad to say, your best bet with that tree is going to be removal. Um, the thing with cabling or bracing that tree is wherever you put that cable, that brace, or wherever you bolt it together creates a weak point in the tree. And where that weak point's at, if that tree twists and turns, you have the possibility of either one of those branches falling over. And where it's close proximity to the house, you probably don't want to do that. So I, like I said, your best bet's probably to remove it. There could have been some included bark in there a little while ago, and that twisting and turning and moving of that tree could have caused that crack to get a little bit deeper or more, um, more pronounced. Um, but unfortunately, I think your best bet's to take it down and think about a replacement tree in that instance. All right, take it down before it takes the house down. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Well, you see them almost everywhere in your gardens. Sometimes they'll flock to the side of your house. No need to panic because we're talking about ladybug, ladybug, fly away home, and they can be very beneficial pests that we talk about all the time on Backyard Farmer. Here's Jonathan Larson to tell us more about them. Lady beetles, or ladybugs as they're more commonly known, are some of nature's most important insect predators. They live in our gardens and in our landscape plantings, and these insects are voracious predators of things like aphids and scale insects. And they consume both of these kinds of pests as an adult and as a larva. The larval form before it pupates and turns into an adult can eat up to 400 aphids during that period of its life. And then as an adult, they're gonna eat an additional 5,000 aphids. So that's a ton of pests that they're removing from your garden, basically for nothing more than room and board. You're giving them a plant to live on and food to eat. And so they're gonna to help to save a lot of your plants from those two kinds of pests. 
We have many different kinds of lady beetles that we can encounter here in the United States. In Nebraska, we have the convergent lady beetle, which has that classic red and black coloration and that domed back that people associate with ladybugs. If you wanted to identify it, you would look on the top of its thorax, that second piece on its body, and it looks like it has these angry white eyebrows on the back of its thorax. These are the identifying traits for the convergent lady beetle. If you saw a 12 or seven spotted lady beetle, I think their names are pretty self-explanatory. You just count the number of spots on their back and then you know what you're looking at. And then we also have the multicolored Asian lady beetle, which is sort of more orange in color and it has that domed appearance, but it also has a black M shape on the back of its thorax, which stands for multicolored Asian lady beetle, of course. These are the mower invasive of the lady beetles, pushing some of those other species out, and they do occasionally come into the house as well, but they are beneficial predators in the summertime. Lots of people wanna use these biocontrol agents in their garden, so you can enhance their populations by performing releases of lady beetles, but that's often best done in a covered garden. So if you have a cage around your garden or a remay row cover or a greenhouse, you can do that. That way the lady beetles don't escape or you can use more biorational pesticides, things like neem, spinosad, or Bt, which will control our pests, but not harm our beneficial predators. If you perform these kinds of tasks, you'll have plenty of lady beetles around to kill all those pesky aphids, and your garden will thank you for it. You know, it really is so important to understand how to use whatever you're going to spray on your garden. Keeping that to a minimum does ensure that those lady beetle friends are going to stick around, help protect your produce. And they're just, they're just so fun. They're just, they're just good. They're, they're ladies. There you go, gentlemen. All right, your turn. Wait. That was kind of sexist, actually. <laughs> you bet. I'm offended. <laughs> okay, so it's, uh, we have another thing on a linden. Uh, and this is by Air Nebraska, A-Y-R. Interesting. Um, white cottony thing with clear liquid oozing out. Wonders what it is and how to take care of it. And then you have a second ID too, but this is the first one. What is that? I had to zoom in real close at this at first, because at first I thought it was a soft scale or a mealy bug that had had enough okay. to, to eat to produce a dew drop. But then when I got really close and looked on and really zoomed up, I could see all the little bubbles in there and it was a spittle bug. I've never seen a spittle bug on a linden. I'm used to seeing them on grasses and forbs down low to the ground, not up on a linden. Tree. Well, and I guess the other ones that we're getting a lot of questions are, are the white, the little white mealy bug looking aphid. aphid, woolly aphids. The woolly aphids? Like a million yeah. of them that kind of look a little If like they're that. somewhere where you yeah. think you need to control them, insecticidal soaps generally do really well for aphids and they're fairly safe on a lot of other things. All right, excellent, thank you. Rock, in turf, we have a monster old hackberry that is not even in the picture. And this particular viewer says, he doesn't know if these are from the root, which would be unlikely with hackberry, but seeds. They come up, they get a foot tall between mowings, they mow them off, and then they branch out and give him some more hackberry. How, how do you control those kinds of seedlings in turf? Well, first off, you can see in the picture that it's close to the curb, so it's thinner, right? So anytime we have thicker turf, that's a good thing, and um, that could be from snow removal and salt. That's why the turf is thin. But that said, um, if, if they want to control them, obviously you could mow them and mow and mow them, and ultimately you'll get rid of them because you'll have clipped all the tips enough that it'll go out. But that will take a long time, and meanwhile, you know, your children can't run across the yard or your dog can't because it's going to get poked at the bottom with these little stems because they can get really woody when they're that short. So, and uh, that's one reason not mowing and mowing doesn't, doesn't necessarily work. Um, you can spray them with any of the commonly used um, type herbicides and probably have adequate results, but nothing to write home about. But if you look at something like a product that has triclopyr in it, which is a uh, product that's used for um, poison ivy control, which is labeled for the pest in that, in that particular case, or the site, because there are also some that are labeled for, so you're not an infraction of the, of the label law, um, that can do a really good job on tree seedlings. It's gonna take multiple applications, but please do not do it until we cool off. 
you do it prior to that, we have run the risk of damage to sensitive vines and tomatoes and grapes and all those other things because that product can move, especially if it's windy, and it can volatilize slightly, not like 2,4-D. But so let's avoid those herbicides when it's really, really hot. And um, you know, you can hand clip closer to the ground as long as you get right at the ground surface. But it looked to me like that was enough of an area. That was just a little snapshot, and there was plenty of, of uh, hackberry seedlings in there. So let's, you know, you, hand removal and hand clipping right at the soil surface will work, but that's a lot of work. All right, thank you, Rock. Okay, Amy, this is uh, from Omaha. Knockout Rose is knocked out, pretty much. Uh, browning, yellowing, she thought it was just the rain and the cooler weather, they're not growing out of it. Holes in some of them, die back on the branches, rust spots on the leaves, what? what? <laughs> we have a plethora of things going on with this rose. <laughs> Had to use Rock's word. Um, <laughs> so we'll start off with this picture. If you look at, we'll back up a picture. If you look at that one, there's these tiny little orange spots on the leaves and that's rose rust. Rose rust is starting to show up this time of year. It isn't a pest that generally overwinters real well in Nebraska. It can if it's protected, but it's one that we see blow in typically from the southern states, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas on its way up. Um, there are some varieties of or cultivars of roses that are resistant to ro rust, but most of the time not. Um, and I'll talk about management about all of them at the end. If we go to the next picture, you're gonna see those dark black spots, and that is black spot. We're real creative in plant pathology terms. Black spot, fungal disease, very common. We see it every single year in roses. Some of our knockouts are resistant to it. Any of your more traditional heirloom roses are not. And so this is a fungal disease that usually starts at the bottom of the plant and works its way up. It can also cause black lesions on the stems themselves and the canes, and you'll actually get curdling, girdling of the canes and death of those canes further up as it progresses. For both of these diseases, fungicide is probably your best bet at this point in time. Black spot's gonna come back every single year, so it overwinters in the debris. So in this fall, you're gonna wanna clean everything out, cut back any of the infected canes as much as possible. But we're gonna be doing a fungicide application. How often you have to make that application depends on the product you go with. If you go with a copper-based product, it's going to be contact, and you're going to have to reapply approximately once a week at least, depending on the label. Some products are going to be more systemic, and so you're going to have protection anywhere from 14 to 21 days. So it depends on how often you want to spray and what product you end up purchasing from your garden, um, garden center. But those are the two main diseases that are coming in there, and probably you're going to see some decline of that rose because of the major pressure on the plant right now. You're not going to have as big and thrifty of blossoms that you've seen in the past just because of the pressure on it. Do not fertilize the plant though because that's going to actually add more stress to the plant. All right. Thanks, Amy. This is a fun ID one, Elizabeth from uh, Louisville, Nebraska. Two trees that bear what they're calling blooms, but the flowers aren't nearly as ornamental as the seed heads. What is this? And talk a little bit about it. This is a really fun <coughs> one. It's the Eastern Hop Horn Beam. <laughs> Say that really fast. Um, but the reason it gets its name is because of the hop-like um, fruiting structures that are on there that follow it. It's really cool. It's more of an Eastern Nebraska plant. It's a substory or kind of one of those um, it likes the shade and protection from other plants nearby. So unfortunately, it's not gonna be one you put out in the middle of the yard and you call it good. It needs that protection, it needs that overstory growth on top of it. But it's a super fun one. Um, it's got really tough wood um, and those hops, hop flowers on there are really fun to look at too. Excellent, so great native mm -hmm. along the river. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we started the growing season with rain, rain, go away. Lately, the temperature has gone over the top and things are really changing in our garden. Here's Terry James to give us our weekly update. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're dealing with heat. Heat is all across the state. Obviously, it's almost the 1st of July and we are gonna have to deal with those spring vegetables that we planted. They are not doing very well, so most of those are coming out. Peas, lettuces, broccoli, all of those are ready to come out of our garden. So they'll be replaced with some summer vegetables like green beans. 
Really excited about getting some new plants growing. We're also seeing our western crops coming up, so our sugar beets and our dry beans are looking pretty good in the garden. We're also starting to deal with drought. We have kind of what they call a flash drought right now, so we're really making sure that all of our vegetables and flowers are well mulched. We are trying not to water overhead. We're trying to water from below and we're trying to preserve as much of that water in the soil profile as possible. We're also having to give our containers a little bit of extra water every day. So make sure you're watering your garden just like we're watering our backyard farmer garden and stop by our backyard farmer garden this week to see how it's growing. So far the heat hasn't done much damage to anybody other than those master gardeners and we say thanks to them for keeping up with the weeding and the watering and sort of laughing at the heat. Good old hardy Nebraska stock. All right, uh, viewer questions. Wayne about emerald ash borer. An Elkhorn viewer has uh, treated with 21.4% imidacloprid around the base based on the size of the tree. Good idea, bad idea, don't know. We're getting to the point of time where we're at the end of the treatment window. Mm -hmm. um, we want to treat in early spring when we have more of the movement up into the plant uh, to get those leaves going uh, through the year, and so that's going to move that product up. Uh, the problem with the midocloprid is that generally it does not work well on the larger trees for emerald ash borer. It does do okay for the smaller trees. Um, Elkhorn, I'm, is that within 15 miles? Yeah. Just barely? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't yep. quite sure. Yep. Uh, but make sure you're only treating when you're within 15 miles of an established emerald ash borer site. So if you're within the 15 miles of those two places, Greenwood and Pulaski Park in Omaha, you know, you need to do need, it. You might want to consider it if you want to save that tree. If you're looking at replacement, that might, you might want to get something started so if it does get hit, you've got something already established. All right, thank you, Wayne. Bindweed rock, is it too late to treat it and what to use? We don't know where this viewer's from, but it's... And do we know where it is or what it's in and about? We're gonna pretend it's in your turf. If it's in my turf, you know, is it too late to treat with, it? you're gonna get some control, but once again, it's way too hot. Let's, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be putting any of these um, broadleaf type herbicides down, even in a granular form. I mean, you get you don't get very good control with the granular forms, but even in a granular form, I'm not going to suggest we do that because uh, non-target injury to those desirable tomatoes and and desirable grapes and other broadleaf crops can happen. It does happen with a frequency as well as our more established trees and shrubs. So I'm going to say, could you treat it now and get some control? Possibly, but I don't think you'd be all that excited about it. And could you damage your sensitive plants? Definitely. So let's not treat it now. Um, bindweed's going to you know, continue to grow prolifically. You can hand pull, or even if you wanted to do a glyphosate wipe with a, a gloved hand and make sure that when you let that vine drop back to the ground, at least then we don't worry as much about a potential injury to non-target plants. But um, could you treat it? Sure. Is it gonna be very effective? Less so, maybe with the glyphosate, you're better off. All right, thank you, Rock. Um, this is a Gretna viewer, Amy, with a question about a dwarf golden jubilee peach planted mm -hmm. in 2012. Got a tiny little few peaches, but a real question is peach leaf curl mm -hmm. and whether a tree that young would show symptoms of it and early and when should she have applied the fungicide if she's going to spray. Um, peach leaf curl can show up on a peach tree at any growth stage. Um, so if it's a newly planted tree or a tree that's been there for three or four years. Typically we see it early in the season um, is when we're going to see the actual symptoms. And so when we look at the fungicide recommendation, we're usually making those applications as the leaves are unfurling. So you're going to follow that standard fruit tree <coughs> spray schedule for peaches to control the diseases and the insecticides. And if you're concerned about um, eating that fruit, if you read the labels correctly, there's a pre-harvest interval. That's the amount of time from that application until you can eat that fruit. And so if you follow a fruit tree spray schedule, that's taken into consideration, but we always suggest that you read that label thoroughly to make sure you're not harvesting it too early and you're not ingesting any of those pesticides. All right, thank you, Amy. Elizabeth, we have a viewer who had to, uh, had to dig some irises up now and the new landscape won't be ready 
What does she do to hold them and does she cut the fans back? Um, to start off, yes, you want to cut the fans back. And I know Wayne would say to check for um, some of the pests that like to get into the iris, the iris borers. Um, so be on the lookout for those to make sure you're not moving them around. Um, if you wanted to, you could try to pot them up. Um, you could put them in a short term uh, location to try to get them um, going, or you could just let them be in a nice cool location for a little bit because July is that ideal time that we want to be moving those iris. So you've just got a little bit of time to hold them over um, and then you'll be good. Thanks for staying with us here on Backyard Farmer. Later on, we'll see a really neat research program focusing on hops the kind that go into the beer that some of us really kind of enjoy, right here on campus. You can still phone in your questions by dialing 1-800-676-5446. While you're doing that, we'll start the lightning round, and I don't mean we drink it on campus, because <laughs> we can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, we have a viewer who has a tomato that has three main stems from the ground. She wonders if that's okay, or should she start over? I'd leave it. All right, when do you remove those white plastic tree guards off a newly planted tree? Ideally, you don't wanna leave them on more than a year. Um, sometimes the wildlife or even the, the insects will get behind them. They really, and also deer will use them sometimes as antler rubs if you leave them on too long. All right, a person just bought Brussels sprouts plants on Scratch and Den. Is there any hope of getting Brussels out of them or not? It depends on your, your days till harvest on that one. Um, some of them are gonna be a little bit longer. I don't know what variety they got, but it's worth a shot. Okay, is summer pruning all right for correcting poor pruning cuts in a crab apple? To an extent. Um, you can do a little bit of corrective pruning. You don't want to remove more than one third of the canopy at any one point in time. But if somebody made some pruning cuts, or let's say you want to have the lawnmower go underneath them, you can go ahead and remove some branches right now. All right. Tomatoes are flowering, but the flowers are drying up. What's happening? It's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case anyone wonders. It's too hot. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it needs to cool off. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> are you ready, Amy? Yes. <laughs> is there a treatment for canker that occurs in an aspen grove? There's really no good treatment for <clears throat> canker. Um, you would have to be spraying all summer long. All right. Is it too late to treat for ash rust? Yes, it is. You have to treat early in the season as the leaves are emerging. All right. Uh, a person used wheat straw on their new turf in, U in Eustis, excuse me, and now they seem to see rust in ornamental grasses and some other things. Is that from the wheat? No, it's not from the wheat. It blew in from the south. All right. Spots on apple leaves and on the fruits, too late? Too late to do anything at this point in time if you're already seeing the spots. Will something called spotted oak leaf fungus transfer to aspen? No, it's very specific to oak only. All right. Is there an actual treatment for fire blight that involves anything short of a pruning saw. <laughs> um, there are treatments available. You're going to be using an antibiotic, so like streptomycin that we use for ourselves. Treatments are very, very expensive. Typically, we don't recommend it unless you're a large orchard having some major issues. All right, nice job. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have one of Dennis's frogs in my throat. All right, are you ready? Rock. Sure. A <laughs> A new sunshade turf mix is up to about three to four inches high. When should this viewer mow that turf? Uh, you should mow it. If you're going to mow it two and a half inches, you can probably mow it three. Mowing will increase density, so you want to mow as quickly as you can with a new seedling. All right, and, and they're also wondering when you should fertilize something like that, like um, If they didn't put down a starter fertilizer, it's too hot to be putting it down now. You've got seedlings that would be susceptible to burn, so I'd wait until it cools off. All right, can those violent rainstorms that have been happening in some parts of the state compact the soil to the point where it needs to be aerated? Only if it's you know bare. I mean, the turf itself is pretty resilient and the thatch is a pretty good cushion. All right, we have a viewer who wants to know uh, when they can harvest buffalo grass seed. Um, actually, you're better off just like nature is letting it overwinter because then you'll get better germination. And remember, there's the male seed head, but the female is, the seed is down below the ground. So you're talking about serious excavation and our, our combines that we use to harvest it actually bring soil up to the surface. So good luck with that. All right. Uh, what works right now on nut sedge? That's a little bit late, but if you want to put sedge hammer down, um, you kind of irritate it and you might push it back a little bit. All right. Thank you very much. All right, Wayne, we've had several calls on your first lightning round question. 
how do you control all those little bitty grasshoppers? Oh, nice heavy rain like we had up in the Northeast last Friday would do perfect for that kind of thing. Wet weather to increase the fungal pathogens. <laughs> and if we don't get any of that rain? Something with carbaryl in it. <laughs> okay, how do you know when to treat for grubs? Well, right now we are past the preventative window. So now you're gonna be looking at a curative uh, round which will start in July. All right, is diazinon still on the market as an insecticide? No. <laughs> Oops, okay. we won't say where that question came from. Uh, what insect eats bindweed? Bindweed, there is a little mite that they have released. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not overly effective, doesn't spread real well, and some of the newer chemistries actually work better than the insect, or okay. mites do. All right, when do you treat for bagworms and with what? You treat for bagworms during the crawler stage. Right now you're getting to the point where we should be almost past that. They're gonna be establishing their little bags. All right, and, and if a person really still wants to give it a shot, would it Hand pulling. Hand pulling, all okay. right. All right, nice job all. And I'm not, I don't know who won. I think we're all winners. You're all winners. There, that's I got the trophy. Hey, where's my trophy? <laughs> you got really a gorgeous thing from Gladys this week. I did. She gave some really fun ones. Um, we'll start with the white one, which is the gooseneck loose strife. And that one's really fun and it gets its name from the way that the, the flowers kind of um, look like a gooseneck. Um, they're perennial and they're really fun. They can be fairly aggressive and spread. Um, but it really likes the wet, damp soil, so that's something to keep in mind with that one. Um, likes that full sun, but can handle that partial shade environment. The other one I think is really cool, and I about brought it as a sample a few weeks ago, uh, but I couldn't get the foliage to stand up long enough from picking it to walking over to the studio, so I couldn't use it. But this other one is called Bear's Breaches, <laughs> or Bear's Breaches, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's got really cool foliage on it that looks kind of like a thistle. And it's really kind of long and spiky, and this is just one here on the flower spike. But, I mean, the, the leaves themselves can be up to several feet long, and then the clumps can be several feet tall. And so it's one that's really fun, um, really different texture out in the environment, really big, bold, and, and looks kind of like a thistle, like I said. But then you get this really fun um, snapdragon-like appearance to it. Um, on those flower stalks. It, it takes several years before it begins to bloom. So that's where it's really fun, where um, Gladys brought it in so we could actually take a look at it while it's in bloom. Excellent, and anyone who wants to visit Kime Hall, we have, a, we have one that just started blooming for the first time in the courtyard. So wander by and see what the real plant mm -hmm. looks like. All right, you get the next uh, picture question, Wayne, and this is a Lincoln viewer, uh, Daylilies. They're on the north side of the house, did get the hail damage. Some of the leaves are kind of typical daylily, but then they found leaves that have white dots and black spots. He's wondering, is this a Roddy and a Spotty or Bug Man? <laughs> this is a Bug Man through and through. Uh, these are aphids. There are only four species of aphids that are recorded on daylilies <coughs> from around the world. One doesn't even occur in North America. One is, this is the wrong color completely, it's red to brown, and these are that whitish green color, which puts it in that Mises genus, it's either Hemerocallus, which is named after the plant, mm -hmm. or the Persicae, which is green peach aphid, which has a very wide host range. Uh, if you're looking to control those, again, an insecticidal soap would probably do the job for you. All right, so pretty exciting to see something that you don't usually see. Yeah, not something you see every day. Yeah, excellent. Okay, Rock, um, the viewer's question on this one, and this is an Eastern Nebraska viewer, is beautiful turf early on. It's a partly shaded environment, not, over, not irrigated, not automatic, you know, a lot from above. But all of a sudden, patches are kind of going gray and then look like they're melting just almost overnight, what is that? I'm gonna say, take a look at the leaves. If there are little lesions on them, it's probably a leaf spot. And for years, people call that Helminthosporium. As Amy can tell you, it's actually a complex of mm -hmm. three um, different organisms. 
um, by Polaris and a couple of other ones. Um, it, it, in bluegrass, it's generally a springtime disease, and then it extends into the summer. And fescue, it's a summertime disease. So I don't know if they have bluegrass or fescue, but but regardless, um, the contact herbicides are marginally effective because it creates so much inoculum. So we're not going to suggest treatment. What we would suggest is usually it's going to happen in a lawn that's 10 years or older, and we do have really good resistant varieties. So maybe an overseeding. If they see it all the time, and maybe an overseeding, and maybe if it's bluegrass in a tree under a tree, that's probably not the best location for bluegrass. Maybe they want to consider a fine fescue or possibly even a turf type tall fescue if they're going to want that under the tree. If it is turf type tall fescue, um, try to go with some of the newer cultivars and they'll probably be better off. All right, excellent. And and he got that one, Amy, because we have so many pathology that's questions okay. tonight. That's fine. So I, was I correct? You are correct. And I, know I, you, I know you like leaf spots and melting out, so yeah. you're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and you have a question about clematis or clematis. This is a Battle Creek viewer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have somebody from Lincoln who has kind of a similar issue. Bottom leaves are green striped. The stripiness is moving up the plant. The flowers started drooping. Uh, waters the lawn uh, and the plants, but hasn't fertilized, did prune to the ground, but this is, this is what it's looking at. Sounds like a good environment for clematis. Um, but looking at the pictures and the way the symptoms are being described, I'm actually gonna be looking at a nutrient deficiency moving on here, uh, maybe some nitrogen or potassium. So to really know what nutrient you're go needing to go after, I would really recommend that you um, collect a soil sample, submit it to a lab and get that soil analysis to know exactly what I'm adding. Um, because it may be nitrogen, it could be potassium, it could be phosphorus. It's really hard to tell. And by having that soil analysis, we're gonna put the right thing down instead of just putting the kitchen sink at it. Um, it'll be better for your clematis long term. So collect the soil sample, and then uh, add the appropriate amendment that it needs. All right, thank you, Amy. And it is hard to tell the difference sometimes between nutrition and it is. Of your rots and spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, thank you. Okay, Elizabeth, this is a Waverly viewer, um, has a bi bicolor corn hybrid, but all of a sudden it's got two of these secondary, and her father calls them suckers. Uh, what's the point? Do they have a function? Do they do anything or should she cut them off? Okay, I would also call them suckers because I'm a tree lady, but apparently in the corn world, they're called tillers. Mm -hmm. um, and these tillers <clears throat> don't really do anything. Um, some people say that they are on corn that's in a good and healthy environment. Sometimes it's varietal or it's based on the cultivar, so some cultivars will have it more than others. Um, no need to cut the tillers off because that main stock is going to outcompete those tillers no matter what. So you could cut them off if you wanted to, but there's no need to. It's just something fun that's growing on your corn. And how in the world they come up with names? Because a tiller to me is like a, a tiller. tiller. It's a sucker. It's off the side. That's because neither, neither one of you are grass people. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and is corn true. is a big grass. Okay, Rob. All right. <laughs> See, the bug guy could have told you that. <laughs> or well, the, the two guys could have, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> <number> and <laughs> the craft brewing industry has really exploded over the past few years. Brewers are always on the lookout for regional ingredients. There's a new research program going on to look at the productivity and yield of growing hops right here in Nebraska. For our second feature tonight, we're going to take a look at what's brewing on campus. Um, this particular project that we're working on is uh, looking at hops as a potential specialty crop. Um, there's a lot of interest in it right now, especially with the microbrewers that are going on. So this project was basically set up just to evaluate the relative success of hops in Nebraska. We're going to do some qualitative analysis, so how good is the hops on an annual basis, which is critical for the, the microbrewers in order to, to know whether or not they're going to have similar product from year to year. As well as we want to get an idea of what the productivity is going to be. So this particular planting that you see is one of our uh, research plots that we have. We have five plots across the state, but this one is more set up like a commercial hops production operation. So it has a 20-foot pole system, trellis system, uh, and we're going to be using this one specifically for monitoring for diseases, insects, as well as um, for some spray treatments because um, hops is new to Nebraska, so we're not sure how 
uh, good the herbicides are going to work in our soils that are labeled for hops, as well as we want to see if there's any um, damage that can occur on these plants. So we have a good team of people coming together on this project. So Keenan Amison, which is heading up the, the breeding, so he's looking at maybe uh, finding some wild hops that has adapted to Nebraska and maybe breeding in some, some qualities to that. Um, we have Kim Todd that's going to help us with the extension education on this. Charlie Shapiro is a, a soil scientist that's going to be helping us with the nutrition and, and the soils. And then we have um, Sam Wartman, who's a new professor, and he's looking at nitrogen fate. So we're going to see how much nutrients taken up by the plant or what uh, disappears, as well as some environmental parameters for us. Uh, a lot of the hops that are grown were originally developed in the Pacific Northwest, and so they have a lot of adaptation traits and pest tolerance to things that are important in that growing environment. And those varieties don't necessarily perform very well in our region. And so my goal with our breeding program is to try and take some of the brewing quality characteristics of those Pacific Northwest varieties and incorporate some of our local locally adapted or native germplasm. So, so we have some hops that are believed to have fallen off of trains several hundred years ago uh, as trains migrated across the U.S. They germinated, established local populations of hops. And so the thought is that those hop varieties, those local wild varieties, tend to have more or better adaptation traits. And so they may have uh, pest tolerance and abiotic stress tolerance that's really important to growing hops in our region. Some of the things that we're looking at is we're just growing it across a variety of areas in Nebraska. Um, the hops production mainly is on the eastern side of the state right now, but we want to see how well it would be out in the exposed areas. One of the problems with hops is it's uh, relative um, problems with some different types of diseases. And one of the benefits we might have in Nebraska is, is a lot of air movement, uh, which will prevent disease problems. But on the other hand, it might cause some problems with the quality of, of the cones themselves. So with the project, we have four different sites that we're looking at, um, wanting to compare elevations, um, exposure, and the types of soils that we have uh, in, in, in the areas. But ultimately, we want to see the relative success of hops in Nebraska and whether that there is a commercial viability to it uh, or if it's just going to be mainly just a specialty crop for small growers. We're going to return to this topic perhaps later on this season or on the winter show to tell you the results of the first year of the project. Sample a little bit of that, that uh, adult malt beverage. <laughs> okay, you get a picture. We're a little out of season for the plant, but pretty cool on both the photography and what, what are those beasties on that pansy? There's two of them on there. Well, the, the bottom one, the orangish red one, that is a stink bug that has recently molted, and the old exoskeleton is what you see above. It's all hmm. shriveled up and no longer has anything to keep it in form. So, and her question uh, early on was whether that was actually causing any damage to her pansies. I've never heard well, of stink bugs eating. Stink bugs generally like to feed on the growing points. If they're one of their herbivorous species, there are some predatory species. That one's a nymph. Nymphs can be really hard to tell whether or not um, they're one of the predatory or herbivorous species. Okay, so all right. So it's a little difficult to say. Okay, the hot weather probably killed them anyway the pansies, not the no. stink bugs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, your last picture comes from the Lake of the Ozarks rock, and it is someone who wants to know the best way to kill large crabgrass in lawns. Uh, he tried dimension, he tried barricade pre-emerge, the, crab, the crabgrass came back. Okay, so they put down a pre-emergent, and when it says it comes back, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I'm going to assume that they didn't get very good control with their pre-emergence. So you put a pre-emergence down, and one of the key things to do is get it watered in, either with timely rains, and you know we did have a wet spring, so a lot of people didn't have to run their irrigation system. But if you don't water it in, a product like Barricade, it's about a three to four day interval on the surface before it's gone. But something like pendimethalin or Dimension, it's about 24 to 48 hours, so it's got to get be watered in. So perhaps that happened. When it reaches a stage that we saw in that picture, which we call uh, tillering, there's that word again. That word. We learned something tonight, <laughs> ladies. Uh, but anyway, if we, 
<laughs> tillering, if it's tillering and it's aggressively tillering like that, you can spray it all you want with some of the post-emergent crabgrass products and it's really kind of a waste of time. So some hand hoeing, it doesn't propagate like purslane, so some hand hoeing, um, that sort of thing, or some hand pulling if it's not too extensive. Realizing that you know if you've got a thin lawn, you're gonna have more crabgrass. Come this fall, um, it's gonna die with the first frost anyway. And then get that pre-emergent down, get it watered in, put down the correct rate, and maybe consider a split application as we get into areas of the um, state where we have extended growing seasons. And, and with global warming, it seems like we two application system is gonna pretty much stick with us. So let's let's think about that. But where did you say it was? Lake of the Ozarks. Yeah, that's definitely a two yeah. application period. So maybe that first one, um, you didn't put on a second one, or maybe you didn't get it watered and a number of things that might have not made it as successful as you think. All right, thank you, Rock. Amy, uh, Lincoln viewer spots on most of the leaves on this ornamental pear. Mm -hmm. What do we have here? We have the notorious pear rust, um, seeing it in pears throughout the area because it was such a wet and cool spring. Nothing you can do at this point in time. Um, the one thing to check is if you have any ornamental junipers in your landscape, pear rust can actually uh, infest your uh, junipers and cause some severe cankers. So um, take a look at your junipers, prune out any areas that have some severe uh, pear rust cankers in them. Otherwise, if we're going to go into another wet season next year, you're gonna make a fungicide application early in the season as the buds are starting to break. All right, thank you, Amy. A Seward viewer has eight Apollo maples planted uh, in the fall of 2014. And one of them he is thinking is either doing poorly environmentally or a different tree. So smaller, thinner, less green. What do we think on this one, Elizabeth? We're probably looking at an environmental type of a condition. Yeah. Um, you know, that tree could be stressed, whether we're looking at a root issue or maybe something going on with the trunk, but the difference between the leaves there, the difference between the colors there, there's definitely something going on within that tree. So I'd take a look and see. Um, I also thought that maybe they had some rock mulch there too. Um, surrounding those trees, so it might have some reflected heat issues later on down the road with some scorch too. So um, just be on the lookout for the tree and look for some of those issues. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we have a couple of announcements of fun things in the gardening world. The first is the Benson Garden Walk, Saturday the 25th, 9 to 3. Uh, we have a uh, more information on the screen for that one. The second one is also a fun one, the Midtown Historic Neighborhood Garden Walk and Heritage Tree Tour on Sunday, and we have both a, a number on the screen on that one. And we don't have a, a screen for this one, but we, the Backyard Farmers, are going to be at Union Plaza here in Lincoln on Wednesday, July 6th, four o'clock in the afternoon, doing one of those great NET live to tapes. A little meet and greet and hope it is not hot, windy, and blowing sand in our faces like it was in Scott's <laughs> Bluff. <laughs> but it'll still be fun, so we'd love to have people come see us. All right, we have time for just a couple of questions here, gentlemen and lady. Carpenter bees making holes into a log cabin in Lincoln, how to control and prevent the reoccurrence. Oh, good old carpenter bees. Yeah. If they're the good, if they are indeed carpenter bees, should be large, they re closely resemble a bumblebee mm -hmm. in coloration. Uh, you need to get that wood sealed properly uh, to, to discourage them from getting into it. All right, give it, give it a good old fill. Yep. Okay, McCook, Rock, nimble will in the lawn. The caller has tried tenacity, but the nimble will still returns. Any thoughts? Um, if they have excessive nimble will, you can control it and there's some hiding or uh, masked by the rest of the lawn. Um, the other thing is, is that sometimes you get better results with putting a surfactant, you know, any of the um, ones available at the garden store. And, and um, finally, the nimble will is tenacious, so you, you might have to put on multiple applications over multiple years to eradicate it all. And just when you think it's all gone, you're gonna see a little patch of it. So it's gonna to have to take, it's gonna take persistence. All right, thank you, Rock. Rust night, Amy, mm -hmm. now it's in strawberries. How to control it in strawberries. <laughs> um, rust in strawberries, typically I don't see rust in strawberries. It's probably more of an anthracnose. Uh, there are fungicide applications you can do. Um, if it's a June bearing, you're probably gonna, those, they should be finishing bearing right now, um, but you can do a fungicide application. Mulch is really the big key on that to make sure the runners aren't touching the soil profile. All right, um, Elizabeth, a Mount Morency cherry is 
dying. The parent is dying. They're wondering whether volunteer seedlings from the tree will be worth saving. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, there's the possibility you might get seedling selection, so you might not get that true from seed. All right, so they're re pretty readily available in uh, most gardens, either Bear Road or garden centers as well. So unfortunately, cherries don't last very long anyway, so they get to start over. There you go.